Wan. Hello. Hi. <laughs> a bit more over the top there. Hello. How are you all? This is the North South Divide podcast. I'm Cameron Archibald. And I, I'm Karen Khan. And today we're going to be discussing the non-controversial, totally friendly, not at all toxic discussion of J.K. Rowling and the subtle, not subtle bigotry within her content. <laughs> and following it, we're going to have another conversation on, strangely enough, Charlie the Chocolate Factory. Why Charlie the Chocolate Factory? How does that link with J.K. Rowling? We're going to find out as we discuss. Anyway... Kieran, I'm going to let you kick off okay. because you were pretty passionate about talking about this. Yes. Um, this in relation to J.K. Rowling's most recent book, which is on the Comoran Strike series, I do believe. And I, I, will, I will say straight up right now, I have not read all the books. I have seen a couple of episodes on the BBC series on it, which are okay i mean i'm not i don't really i watch them with a family but I'm, I'm not actually seen the books themselves uh so karen why is this book in the news so so why she's in the news so uh so basically she has basically spent the entire year basically attacking trans people and um and she and she and she has really and she has written very controversial tweets about trans people uh, and then fast forward to pretty much near the end of the year a new book uh, a new book comes out, was it written by her, which is then uh, which then features a cis man who who dresses up as a woman to actually kill his victims, and and this is very controversial, and this is and this is such a very transphobic stereotype because because of all the bathroom uh, drama and all the bathroom laws because because uh, because it is a stereotype that like transphobic people like to say that if we if we allow trans women to use what's it, to use the women's bathrooms, uh, like men will dress up as as women to basically uh attack women and and stuff like that so so yeah i i um i i i'm not surprised this has happened because of because of all the transphobic stuff that um uh, that she has said over the past year and mm. and and also and also like when you take a look at her previous work there's also some very dodgy stuff in there which which um which which completely uh which completely threw me off uh, as a child because because obviously I read Harry Potter for the first time as a child and 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 like rereading all the all the books as an adult and like doing some like deeper research into this after after she's uh, like came out as this like really bigoted person and and first of all I've, and first of all one thing that that really shocked me that I didn't understand as a child is that how that how the Irish kid, um, was James Finnegan, I think his name is. Yeah, and um, yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, uh, so literally, he is the only main character in Harry Potter that is from Ireland, and he likes to blow things up. And and and, and like when I was a kid, I didn't really understand that that was actually linked to like Sinn Fein and the and the and the IRA and like the troubles. Like I didn't. Like I didn't understand that when I was little, and mm-hmm. and, and well, tell tell you what, before we get to that, yeah. do you want to stay on this book just now? Um, because I've just got a copy of the Telegraph to review on it. Okay. For those, who, the book. By the way, do you know how long the new book is? By the way, the new book's called Troubled Blood. Guess how long the book is? Is it like four hundred, five hundred pages? I'm guessing it is nine hundred pages long. This book. Oh really? Oh. Um, wow. Yeah, and. The Telegraph had a review of it. They were probably the first major paper to come out with a review. They gave it a three out of five star. Okay. And their their summary of it is, Strike and Robin's fifth outing is a good on characterization, weak on everything else, and has a subplot to make Rowling's critics fume. Um, now, for those who don't know, as, well, we do know because we were just pointed at the very beginning of it, um, it, it's based on the trope of, a kind of transphobic trope of cis men uh, will abuse uh, abuse the right to basically dress up as a woman and attack cis women effectively, not just cis women uh, to be fair, attack also the trans women as well, or, or attack any any kind of woman to be fair. So that's kind of the main kind of kind of shock from this. Um, there's also 
you know, when we, we look deeper into our literature, there's also a lot of other kind of transphobic stereotypes. Um, we're going to, I want to read out a passage. Now, I actually read this out to you here. And I said, said this to you, like, just before we started this, but yeah, uh, yeah. 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, this is from, now, just for our context, the passage we're going to read it out is from uh, one of the Stryker books, and it's one of the authors who's been killed in the book. So this isn't J.K. Rowling. I mean, J.K. Rowling wrote this, but it's not her as an author writing this. It's the character author in the book that wrote this. So, quote, He took a drink of tea, reassuringly hot and clean, and read on. Boyinks was on the point of leaving Harpy's house in disgust when another character burst in through her door. Ipicone, one of the sobbing Harpy introduced as her adopted daughter. A young girl whose open robes revealed a penis, Epico insisted that she had bombix were twin souls, understanding, as he did, both the male and the female. She invited him to sample her hair from, no, how do you pronounce it again? Hair from a, hair, how do you pronounce it here? Hair <laughs> body. I can't pronounce it. I can't pronounce it. Hermaphrodite body. <laughs> but the first to hear her sing, Apparently under the impression that she had a beautiful voice, she emitted barks like a seal until Boyx ran from her with his ears covered. Now, right there, this is just a kind of, now, right there, this is, this is just quite gentle. Now, obviously we shouldn't immediately assume that because the dead author in this book wrote this, J.K. Rowling herself uh, is transphobic. But, there is not an immediate relation between this sort of transphobic dog whistle in which the, you know, when trans women are effectively, um, are effectively just really masculine and manly and have horrific sort of voices and are kind of grumbly. Uh, and also as well, the idea that this person's, her, 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 pronounce the word for me again, Kira, because I can't pronounce the Aphrodite. word. Yeah, that's also a trope as well. And actually, that is usually to uh, attack intersex people. Mm. So it's, uh, it's, a very, it's, an, it's an interesting one. Uh, now, the reason I highlight that is because it's worth pointing out that just because someone in and in a character in a book may be, may be phobic in any sense does not automatically mean that the author themselves are phobic of any sort. But what's interesting is the fact that there are many other phobias within our literature which don't actually seem to do anything with the story. They don't actually create a message. They don't drive narrative. They don't put any sort of character development in there or challenge. It's just, it's just kind of there. Um, I'm going to read a, another one. Now, I, again, I should have you, Kieran. This is the kind of Islamophobic one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Which, it just gets uh, worse and worse. Yeah, I'll read this out to you and I'll actually discuss with you again something I asked you. So, um, where is it again? It's uh, okay. So, this is another strike book and it's basically describing it's two characters discussing uh, camera footage they've seen. So, uh, quote, and this is a, uh, this is a character speaking in the beginning of this. The only cameras at the wrong angle for the house, it watches traffic. Sorry, the only cameras, yeah, this is a because sorry, I'm going to restart that. <clears throat> the only cameras at the wrong angle for the house, it watches traffic, but I'm saving the best to last. We've got a different neighbour, other side, four doors down, who, wears, who swears he saw a fat woman in a burqa letting herself in on the afternoon of the 4th, carrying a plastic bag from Halal Takeaway. He says he noticed because the house had been empty for so long, he claims that the, uh, she was there for an hour and then left. And the other character responds, he's, sh he's sure she was in the Quinn's house, so he says. And she had a key, that's a story, a burqa, repeat strike, bloody hell. Now, interesting enough, I don't know a bit about this particular uh, bit, and it's interesting because there's there's nothing in the narrative that specifically makes Stryker to kind of have that random outburst to suggest he's uh, Islamophobic. Mm. And that in itself, the kind of Burqa trope is the idea that, similar to the trans trope, uh, that men will just use a Burqa uh, to abuse a system in order to yeah. harm others effectively. Yeah. Uh, and I, I remember reading this really shocked, like, 
because this has no narrative to it. There's no purpose to striker uh, strikes or say uh, having this sort of weirdly regressive attitude. And when I, I messaged you, here, I don't know this. I was like, I was so concerned, so concerned that it was so deeply uh, bigoted that I. I was just saying, okay, can you read this? And you read it. And I was like, by the way, halal takeaway, that's a thing, right? Because in Leeds, there's a halal takeaway. But because JK wrote it down, I thought to myself, no, nah, there, there, there's got to be a phobia here. But uh, I'd ask you, Kira, you, you, you explained there was halal takeaway, the actual thing. Okay. Okay. Let me, let me explain. Like, like, because I come from a Muslim family, uh, I know quite a lot about this. But, but basically, halal takeaways are a real thing. And, uh, and I have two, and I have two near me. And well, actually, in Crawley, there's loads. But, but like, by my house, there's, there's like one, there's like one by my house. It's a Turkish one. And it's really nice. But, um, I, I, like, when I used to eat meat, I used to eat that all the time. But I don't eat meat anymore. But so, yeah. Um, so, so, uh, so her last takeaways are a real thing. That's, that's, that, um, that is not the issue that I take with this. I guess the issue that I take with this is that this is, uh, this is basically, uh, this is basically dog whistling, like the stereotype that like, people would like, uh, uh like commit crimes under burkas and to obviously go undetected so so i guess like i guess like uh, that is my main problem also with this was also with this paragraph and i guess it yeah so yeah that's just my main problem with it and yeah i'm gonna read out another one as well this is <laughs> from the the same book uh, i think half this podcast is going to be me reading about <laughs> JK's literature. Um, so uh, this is from the say, roughly from the same section. Uh, so, quote, a young woman wearing hijab was watching them talk from the opposite seat. She had a large, sweet, liquid brown eyes. Assuming somebody really did enter the house on the 4th, I've got to say, a burk is a bloody good way of getting in and out without being recognised. Can you think of another way of totally concealing your face and the body that wouldn't make people challenge you? And they say, where, and, they, and they were carrying halal takeaway, question mark? Allegedly, that was the last, that was his, that was, I'll try it again. Allegedly, was his, was his last meal halal? Is that why the killer removed the guts? And this woman could have been a man. Now, I'm not going to say anything, uh, but Kieran, what's your immediate response to that? Uh, I guess my, I guess my uh, immediate response to it is, yeah, it, it, it's basically, uh, it, it's basically dog whistling a lot, a lot of the of the um, Muslim Muslim stereotypes, and yeah, I. Just, <laughs> I I was in such shock when I was reading all these paragraphs. Was was when I was just reading all these paragraphs like for the first time, and 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 like and they're all like, spilling out of Twitter like <laughs> over the few nights. Like people were just finding quotes and just shitting them on Twitter, and everyone was like, "What? This is it? This cannot be real. This is ridiculous. Yeah, I know. How did someone write this?" And then it's like, "Oh yeah." JK, JK Rowling, billionaire author, wrote this in her book, and it's all here for everyone to see. And especially someone like JK Rowling, like if I was JK Rowling, I would I would try to tone down the controversy, especially because she spent this entire year basically like crapping on like loads of minorities. And so so but uh, but they near the uh, but near the end of the year she kind of comes up with this very controversial book and and uh, <laughs> i don't know why she's trying to add to her own controversy because because like she's like one of the richest people in the world like 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 she doesn't need the money she doesn't need the attention because like because like because of harry potter like the eyes of the world are always watching her because of Harry Potter, right? So, 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 I just, I just don't understand like why she's trying to add to her own controversy when it's going to do nothing for her because, because like she, because she already has the money, she already has the fame, she already has the attention. So I just, I just don't understand like, like why she is doing this. I just yeah, don't. you know what? Let's talk about Harry Potter, but before we do, let's just reiterate that just because. In a book, a character may be bigoted or biphobic or homophobic or Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, whatever. 
just because a character is like that does not mean the author is. Yeah. Their characters have a narrative to them or a story to them where they begin off with a bigotry and they may or may not resolve it at the end. And that's totally fine for an author to write that. that and the author could be fine there. But let's stick to this kind of common theme here, which Rowling seems to write this sort of uh, these tropes within their characters and they never actually do anything for the character and let's go back to what you said so we're going to Harry Potter now and Harry Potter is, is absolutely full of tons of these kind of characters who are based on massive stereotypes and they never and they're never done for any sort of narrative other than to you know basically create a goofy stupid character based on stereotypes so the, who was the character you mentioned the Irish one uh, I, I, keep, I keep forgetting his name um uh, it was a shame speaking. Right. So tell, talk me through who this character is or yeah. <clears throat> what, what the issues of this character. Yeah. Well, basically, well, uh, well, basically, well, J.K. Rowling started, started writing this in the, in the early 90s. So, so I guess that was, that was sort of the time where like the troubles was like coming to an end, I think. And, 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 and yeah, it was getting it was getting a, a lot a lot of publicity but the uh, uh, but like with this but with this uh, character specifically so basically um he he is the only irish irish main character in the story and he likes to pro- and he likes to blow things up and and also his his initials are are um are, are um um SF. S- SF yeah and 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 they said and and obviously that's his name but uh, um but that but that also is the is the initials for um efficient fame which i think which i think used to be the political wing of the of the ira i don't think they have any links with the ira in present day but i think like back in the day i think like there was some links there, and yep. um, yeah, and obviously, and obviously, Sinn Fein and the and and the and the IRA specifically are um, are are known for their are known for like the Brighton bombings and like all these all these other and like and and all these other terrorist acts. So so uh, so that is basically like so that is basically like. Um, a kind of like a play on on like on like Irish people are like terrorists because obviously because of the stereotype of the of the IRA and, and when I was a kid I never understood that but then but then when I was a kid I I never really was educated on the whole Irish politics anyway but um but yeah so so that was something I was very was it I was a shock to find and and also and also with um with was it Cho Chang as well, which is I think the only Chinese uh, kind of Asian character in the in the um, in the story and and yeah that is that is another stereotype as well. So I guess I guess like she is playing on these like stereotypes, but but she's doing it in a very subtle way and so mm-hmm. so so. so so that like, you wouldn't notice it if you were just like a casual viewer or, or like a casual reader of the books. You, you think. wouldn't notice it if you were especially, if you come from a largely white straight and yeah. perhaps a non-religious background, Yeah, you might not immediately notice these things. But I've got to touch on another example just now, actually. Um, so let's talk about the names, actually. So you know how all these characters in Harry Potter obviously have like spontaneously crazy names for you know uh, for their benefit like severus snape albus dumbledore dolores umbridge knife Tonks, luna lovegood you name it. all these characters in fedora in fedora yeah sorry <laughs> yes, i can't even pronounce that right they all have re- ridiculous so good names like they're, they're memorable though and yet when it comes to the one of the like there's hardly any like for well first of all Harry Potter in the films, hardly any diversity whatsoever. It's like 99% white. But when it comes to these Asian characters, let's talk about, for example, Cho Chang. Now, Cho Chang, J.K. Rowling just shoved two regular you know, you know, Asian names together and put that as for the Asian character. But all these white characters get really cool, spontaneous names. 
and that's it. That that that's the done. And then, for example, there's also the what are the sisters called again? Is it the Patel sisters? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, now, I'm not going to speak personally in this one because um, I I don't know much about the because these characters are they're, they're Indian twins, for they believe, and I don't know about I don't I'm not expert in Indian culture, but when I was looking into this earlier, there was a lot of Indians basically saying that when it came to the Goblet of Fire and it came to like the Yule Ball. Um, their kind of dress was basically almost an insult. It was basically dull, it was unflattering. It was basically a mockery of Indian culture. And again, I think this is kind of going back to the fact that J.K. Rowling will invest tons of character development and tons of character design when it comes to white characters, because obviously yeah. that's with you know that's within her deemed kind of British culture. But the minute it comes to like anyone, literally any other character out with this kind of British bubble, she'll go, okay, I will um I will just add two Korean names together and that'll be it. That'll that'll be Cho Chang. And, oh we'll uh, the, the the Patel sisters, they they're there. Uh, they can just have uh, Indian outfits, whatever they are, we'll just make that happen. There, boom, that's it, Ta-da. and that's it. Oh yeah, and uh, the, uh, the, the Irish boy, he can blow stuff up like Sinn Fein. Ha ha ha! You know, it's like her basic research into these other cultures is basically what she might see on TV uh, at one point uh, during the nineties, which obviously wasn't exactly a progressive time for. Well, not my, you know, not well, not like the sixties and seventies, but at the time was basically still based heavily on tropes for other kind of representations for other cultures. So there was obviously no research done there. But I don't know if you also remember as well. Do you remember one of the worst ones when it came to Dumbledore? Yeah, I th- I think so. This is the what? This is when. She magically tar- turned Dumbledore gay. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. There was, there was, there was nothing at all in it about the books, and and I, I guess it was hinted at in Deathly Hallows. Like, um, like, like, um, like, if you go, if you guys. If you guys haven't read Deathly Hallows, um, uh, it goes into a lot, a lot of backstory between uh, between Albus Dumbledore and his and his and his old friend Grindelwald, and and uh, and in the book there was nothing about a relationship. It was basically like, oh, they were good friends, and then Grindelwald like betrayed them because he stole the Elder Wand, I think. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, so like, so there was nothing about a relationship between them two in. Uh, and and then and then after and then after the publication of the book and after and after she made all her money then she was like oh by the way uh, it was Dumbledore's gay that whole time and like I just didn't say anything about it I was like okay <laughs> now, the, yeah. now the now the now the issue here isn't that Dumbledore is gay obviously that is not the issue at all but the issue is she decided to do that after the books uh, had already written like it, um, like like there was nothing in like all seven books about it i guess i guess there were hints in deathly hallows with like the backstory between him and grindelwald but but then but 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 it was never like specifically said at all so so i just so i just i just don't understand that um i just I just don't understand that when she when she already sold the book like millions of times and when she uh, when she already made the money then she decided to say oh by the way uh it was it was basically like PS Dumbledore was gay the whole time basically yeah yeah, yeah that, and- that that PS bit is really important because it's <laughs> basically goes as an afterthought she yeah. never cared about any character being LGBT until she suddenly realised that oh wait it's 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 the twenties now yeah. uh, I guess I have to oh no there's gay everyone yeah. he's gay ha ha yeah, yeah, it doesn't then, mean anything I just I just want to be cool ha ha yeah and the, and like and like and, and like Harry Potter does have a very large LGBT fan base because uh, because because because. Uh, I do think a lot of LGBT people can relate to Harry in in some sort of way because because uh, because he was very like because he was like very treated badly from his parents and he was like 
almost rejected uh oh no no not his parents uh, his um his his aunt and uncle so 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 um so he was basically like almost rejected like like from his family that actually raised him and 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 he was forced to live in the cupboard under stairs so so i guess i guess a lot of lgbt people could could probably relate to that so so like so so like Harry Potter does have a large LGBT LGBT fan base and and I guess like when JK Rowling realized that like like and yeah so so then like when she realized that then she decided to do that and and, and I don't think there would have been a problem because because it was 2007 when uh was it when Deathly Hallows was 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 released so things weren't perfect but like things were getting there like when it came to rights so like things weren't perfect but things were getting there so 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 i don't think there would have been a problem like uh like in deathly hallows like uh, so so that so then when she was going through all this backstory because 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 that backstory is very relevant to the entire plot of the book because it's about the elder ones which is one of the three deathly hallows right so 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 that is a huge backstory because it's because it's because it is related to the elder ones but i don't think there would have been a problem had she actually mentioned the relationship in that book so i don't think there would have been a problem because because it was 2007 things weren't perfect but things were getting better so i just i just don't think there would have been a problem but but i think that she feared the backlash from uh, was it from like i think she feared the i think she feared the backlash so that's why she didn't specifically write it in the book but i, I mean these traits I mean, these traits could have been developed anyway though like even if she did mention in 2007 that Dumbledore was gay that could have been developed further down the line by maybe a prequel and explaining about how how his sexuality is explored uh, later on um well i'm going to touch on um tonks and lupin again uh yeah, so yeah. Like, like for example lupin can turn to a werewolf, a werewolf yeah and tonks uh, she can change her appearance as well. I think that's like a metamorphosis yeah, yeah, sort of thing. Um, yeah, now, she can change the colour of her hair, I think. Yeah. Now, Lupin's struggle as a werewolf, that has been, in a sense, a kind of a representation of people who have, have HIV or, or kind of AIDS, basically, and the plight with it, and sort of internal struggle with that. And the idea uh, of... Uh, okay, okay. Tonks, and, I and the idea of talks. I mean, I this is—I mean, this one. is in stone. It's still, i don't know if J.K. Rowling has actually said this, but how people have translated that is quite interesting. And also, people have said that uh, Tonks herself—the idea that she can change her appearance to will—is almost a representation of being gender fluid. Now, these things are there as representations. They're in the book, and that's how fans have translated them. And I think that's really good for for fan bases, for the fan. But when it comes to you know queer characteristics for Potter fans, Rowling just gave them nothing, pretty much. And I think that's really, really, really telling. Because, again, this is all an afterthought. And um, and you remember as well, in the new films, uh, what were the new films called? It was the, uh, I saw the first one, and it was kind of boring. Oh, I think, um, it was, uh, was it Fantastic uh, Beasts? The, the, the Aussie Animal one. Yeah, Fantastic Beasts are where to find them. So. Yeah. JK Rowling and the world. Up, oh, Dumbledore is going to be gay, everyone. <laughs> Watch out. The gay scenes on the chase. And then there was also the sequel to that one as well. What was that one again? That was um uh, Crimes of Grindelwald. Yeah, the crown yeah. So in both these films, when it came to the idea of Dumbledore being gay, nothing was actually shown with him. And why it was relevant to be gay, even though she had the chance to go back and write in a sort of character trait of him being gay and why that might actually be relevant to his later on character, or even just to show there's a representation there for queer people and queer port fans, there was nothing, absolutely zero. She put in no effort to make up for the missing pieces she claimed she wanted to fill the gaps in for. There's absolutely nothing. In fact, there was a really awkward thing in that film as well, where the only Asian character they had uh, turned out to be a slave, a snake what? slave as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. 
does in the second one as well, and it relates to as a whole as a whole. Compl- I don't know how to explain the story. It's completely confuggled. But basically, in this, the Asian character is a slave. The Jewish character turns into a Nazi. Yep, uh, oh, actually, I can't believe I had to say that. Actually, and, there is there is one thing that uh, that uh, that I actually just remember now. You mentioned that, but um, go. Yeah, but yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So basically, uh, and so basically, uh, you know the goblins in Grindelwald in um uh, in the um, in not not going. Uh, oh, so Gringotts. You know the goblins in Gringotts. Yep. You know how they have big noses and and and. Oh, uh, I know where this is going. I know where this is going. <laughs> Yeah. Get, yeah so. get 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 ready. Sit back tight because this one is arguably the worst of all the tropes in this yeah. movie. Please go on. Oh, yeah. Christ. So basically, <laughs> so basically, um, so basically, the goblins in Gringotts they they have big noses and they're obsessed with gold. And <laughs> I can see you covering your face, but yeah. Yeah, and it's just so, horrible. Go on. So that, so that this is a very anti-Semitic trope. Like this is this is such an anti-Semitic trope. About uh, about um, Jews. About how Jewish people uh, yeah. they look like that, and they're and they're obsessed with wealth, and and yeah, it is it, it it is just awful. And what is even more ironic about that stereotype is that she then later down the line accused Jeremy Corbyn of being anti-Semitic when Jeremy Corbyn has done more to fight racism than than she has ever done. So yeah. <laughs> so um so yeah, so it's just also also note as well that she describes them having beady eyes, which is another stereotype for Jews. And also as well, this is also like a secret like this is a secret world as well basically amongst like mortals of these goblins hoarding all this money so it just it's just fucking <laughs> awful honestly it's genuinely like when you watch it now if you went back to watch it you'd realize how just just it's, it's almost you can't unwatch it you can't unsee that it's just there it's, it's completely there for every single person to see and yeah actually speaking of jk rowling you know of throwing accusations of who who is isn't a real humanitarian, she handed back as well. Just as, as a side thing, by the way, uh, she handed back her human rights award to oh, the Robert she... Kennedy Foundation. Oh, okay. uh, I don't remember. I don't remember how she won it, <laughs> but when the Robert Kennedy Foundation basically went, "Hey, what you're doing is transphobic," she, you know, she literally she had like I can't stress this enough. She had a human rights award. Something which people would be absolutely proud of having. Something which is like shows how much of an amazing person you are. And she handed it back because she was called out for her transphobia. If you hand back a human rights award, that's probably an indication that you're doing something really fucked up. And I don't know how you can oh you're the good God. guy in this situation. It's oh my God. Like, and, like, you know, like, oh, like, go on, go on. Like, <laughs> Like, like this is this is all sad to me because because I love Harry Potter. Like I like 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 I have always loved Harry Potter. Like I have all the seven books on my shelf. I I do have like multiple copies of like first editions uh, and like rare and like rare copies of the books. Like like I love Harry Potter, right? So uh, so like to go back and like reread it and then see all these tropes especially now we live in a different world like we live in 2020 now where like some of these things are just not okay and and yeah it it, it is sad like like yeah. to see like to see this franchise like not be as not be as accepting and not be as open as you thought it would be and yeah. it's even more sad when the when the when the when the when the author turns out to be this huge bigot it's like oh god <laughs> Also, one other thing, just before we move on to another point, one other thing as well. Do you remember when she endorsed the idea of her, uh, Hermione being black? Yeah. Now, again, the idea of Hermione being black is absolutely fine. No, no, no one's going to dispute that. But it was when she said she never wrote Hermione being being white and actually is open to her being black. And then when anyone, literally anyone reads the book, all you see, well, there's two things. A, all her writing indicates that Hermione is white. Based on all the descriptions of Hermione, she is white, right? There's absolutely no denial about it. So basically, again, this is like a second thought. After the book she wrote, she's like, oh, wait, no, Hermione could be black, actually. Again, never actually caring if she was black in the first place. And also as well, the art that she gave a thumbs up to on all these characters, in every single depiction 
of Hermione when she originally white. wrote those books, she was always white. And yeah. every, pretty much 99% of all the other characters that she gave the thumbs up for the designs for, white. they were all yeah, white. And, um, and so again, it's a, the idea of her being black was an afterthought. She never cared in the first place. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I remember. I remember when the Cursed Child um, was uh, was like first coming out, and they were making a stage play. And and yeah, and yeah. I I was very pleased about the diversity. Uh, and J.K. Rowling did mention that. Oh, um, I never specifically specified that that Hermione was white, but but it's it, it's just so obvious. And and especially when like when like. Emma Watson became like obviously the fire, obviously, obviously like the face of Hermione like when she was playing her. So like 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 everyone will think she was like like she's white. Like like it's yeah. it's not. I don't think it's anything that she that she that she ever considered. But um, but the cursed child is like like no one really considers the cursed child a, a thing anyway. Which which like makes it which like makes mm-hmm. it even more worse because. Because like, because 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 like we did have a tiny bit of diversity when it comes to her, when it comes to her, when it comes to Hermione being black. But because the cursed child is like really panned, and because the cursed child, firstly, it wasn't written by Rowling. I think she probably had a hand in it, but it wasn't written by she, her. She was a, I do believe, not not was she a producer? I think she may be a I producer. Think, but, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the problem with the cursed child is that it doesn't make a, a, a like 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 even even if we take out everything else, the actual plot of the cursed child it doesn't make sense at all. It it's supposed to be canon, but like they they destroyed a lot a lot of the plots. Like first of all, they gave Voldemort a kid, but his whole thing was he couldn't feel love. So it's like <laughs> what? Well, well, to be fair, people. <laughs> Uh, uh, sh- have, having a shag and having love is two different things to be fair I mean yeah. you, can, you can shag it pure self hate I guess yeah um, yeah. yeah so, <laughs> I, so the, I wasn't expecting to say that in this podcast <laughs> yeah yeah so like so like I mean like this is turning into like a mini rant just about the cursed child but like the, but like the entire plot of the entire series that Voldemort can't feel love. Like that's that's one of the most important plots of the entire books. But then in this like new story, which is obviously not canon, but people think it's canon, but it's not really canon. It's like they gave him a daughter. So they kind of like destroyed the whole, oh, he can't feel love because he has a kid with Bellatrix. So it's like <laughs> but so 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 it is a shame that that the one piece of diversity we got within the story uh, uh, with like, Hermione being black, which was huge at the time, and it's really good that they actually made her black in this in the play. So it's sad that that the only bit of diversity we got was that it was a very pan play because no one really liked it because because it destroyed yeah. a lot of the, yeah yeah. Also, it, just be, just before I go to the next point, I do want to say one thing as well. This is a, this is a personal one for me. I feel that I feel personally attacked by it, but. <clears throat> Hogwarts, set in Scotland, <laughs> not a single Scottish student. I'm sorry, where where are the Scottish students? Why is there actually, the greatest? Actually, like, why is there the greatest Scot like the greatest m- magical school on, on the earth, based in Scotland, and there's hardly any Scottish characters? Where are they? Hello. Actually, I where are you? Actually, where, I where are you? I don't think that's. <laughs> I don't think that's quite true because because Cho Chang was played by a Scottish woman, so that's not quite true. And also, um, uh, uh, no, uh, no, 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 sorry, no. Okay, you can't deploy a stereotypical character against me in this argument. <laughs> Secondly, no, I don't care but, who the actress also, or actors are. The characters are not Scottish. Okay, who's the woman again? Like the older woman who's actually like really badass. Um, uh, what's her name? McGonagall. Uh, she. McGonagall. She, she is. Scottish. is uh, she, she is Scottish. I will take that. Everyone else, but every also, other student, but, but everyone else are, also, is, is, is not Scottish. What? what in a I Scottish mean, school, I can, no. I can, I can, I can, I can understand what you're saying. But actually, Oliver Wood was Scottish, actually. So you're sort of wrong about that because uh, because it's Oliver Wood. Oliver Wood was a Quidditch was a Quidditch head coach uh, was was a Quidditch captain for for, uh, 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 for Gryffindor for the first three books before he left. Oh, I thought he was Irish. 
No, 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 no. Wait, hold on. Wait, what's his name? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm looking at very briefly. What's his name? <laughs> Oliver Wood. <laughs> Oliver Wood Harry. Wait, is this the actor? Yes, the actor is Scottish. Wait, is the actor Oliver Wood? Yeah, no, no, no. no the actual not, character. Okay. The actual character. Oh. Oh, okay, all right, all right, all right, let's see this. If he's, if he's Scottish, <laughs> he, okay, he is Scottish, okay, he, he is, okay, he, he is. He is Scottish. I thought he was Irish, okay, but one sort of student is not that. enough. No, okay, sorry, one student's not enough, right? <laughs> if you're in Scotland, I expect, I, I expect, I expect like a solid, at least solid 40% of your to be Scottish, okay? That means I want a, Sc- a solid Scottish wizard army in Scotland, but there's none, I don't accept this. We're moving on to the next point. Don't it's even good. fight me on this, Kieran. No, no, no. I, I, I am standing. I will die in this hill. None of Scottish students. Is this your inner Scottish nationalist coming out? Is, is this your inner Scottish nationalist? I mean, as, even though I'm largely joking, yes. <laughs> but, Kieran, I've got a question for you. Have you seen a film called Silence the Lambs? I haven't. I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So this is, this is an interesting point. So Silence of the Lambs, is is a, is a classic uh, sort of thriller book, and it's basically how do I put it? It's basically about this cop that has to hunt down a serial killer called Buffalo Bill, and this Buffalo Bill character is effectively a transvestite in this in this book, okay. and this and basically he's kidnapped women, and if, if I do understand it, I haven't seen it in a while. He basically kills them. And skins them. He's basically trying to create a new suit for himself, basically like a like a cocoon, basically a cocoon, if I can say that correctly. Um, and anyway, it's a whole. I won't explain the other details of the story, but basically that is the main premise of it. And a lot of people, when J.K. Rowling kind of came out with her transphobic book, a lot of people were saying, "Well, hold on a second. How come Silence of the Lambs, which depicts a transvest a transvestite killing people?" Um, is not cancelled. I think they've cancelled. I say in quotation marks. Obviously, that's can I bring up another it. topic on that as well? Huh? Yeah. 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 Uh, oh, yeah. Can I make another another topic about that as well? So, um, so, um, so if you if you guys have watched Pretty Little Liars, right? Um, if you um, have you watched Pretty Little Liars? I have not. No. <laughs> okay. Well. Well, basically, Pretty Little Liars is is basically a series about uh, about four teenage girls who get stalked by by the psychopath, and so um so um uh, but um but uh, but at the um so during the entire series, loads of people take on this uh this role as a psychopath. It's basically it started out. At, it started out as just one girl, and and then it keep, and then like more people got involved in this whole team, and it became like this whole team. And but then, but then, but then at the at the end of the f- fifth series or the sixth series, before the time jump, uh, in the last series, um, the the latest psychopath uh, uh, to stalk these people was actually a trans. Uh, was actually a trans character and so um so um but then so 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 i don't remember people being uh, there was a little bit of outrage about that but um but uh but but i don't remember people being as outraged as like what's going on now so um so 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 like so if that storyline was like being like rewritten today i don't think that i don't think they would have done that i don't think they well, would have this this might be interesting then because what I'm about to say may actually almost answer your question. So going back to the sense of the lambs, basically. So there's a question of well, why wasn't uh, the character in Sense of the Lambs almost well, not just the character the book itself cancelled and the film as well. It's a great film. You should watch it by the way. Um, if you ever bother to watch anything, I recommend to you. Hey, I, <laughs> um, I, I, I I I'm too busy playing Pokemon Go, but uh, but anyway, carry on. Get me started. Anyway, so why uh, is this character not cancelled, basically? And there's two reasons for it. The actor playing Buffalo Bill, who I can't remember the name off the top of my head just now, uh, he had done an, an incredible amount of research into the LGBT community. But more specifically, um, well, I think Ted Levine, I think it's Ted Levine, that's the character, that's, that's the actor's name. He basically did a ton of research into kind of 
LGBT issues and also into the character themselves. And basically, he concluded in the kind of development of this character that this this kind of serial killer it wasn't that he himself was a transsexual uh, or a uh, transvestite sorry uh, he, he wasn't he actually hates lgbt people and he ha- hated you know homosexuals and lesbians so much uh, and, tra- and, transgender, and transgender people so much that he basically tried to kind of embody those kind of characteristics to basically mask his own insecurities, which is a really, really big part to point out because that in itself is, that's basically to highlight it's more of a kind of an actual serial killer mindset rather than, oh, this is just an evil transvestite or, oh, it's just a cis man trying to disguise himself as anything. So it's more about the serial killer mindset. The second thing is as well is in the book, there's also a lot of effort to make the point that people who are transsexual, uh, transvestite, or trans as a whole, they're completely decent people. And there's actually a deleted scene, I do believe, from the film, which was removed just because there wasn't much narrative to it, but it was removed on the basis of the fact that, uh, yeah, it was removed on the basis of the fact that there wasn't much narrative to it. But basically in that film, uh, the, the main character, Crawford, I do believe, you know, Detective Crawford, goes to speak to a doctor and basically, who is a, a reassignment clinic. And basically that doctor in the lead scene goes that trans people are absolutely decent people. And Crawford, the main character, agrees to this as well. So already, and we already have that in the book. I wasn't in the film, but we already know that in the film that uh, another character who is basically Hannibal, I don't know if you know Hannibal's character, but... Um, He says in the film, um, I've got a quote here saved, Billy is not a real transsexual, but he thinks he is. He tries to be. He's tried to be a lot of things, I expect. So really, it's about the the mindset of a serial killer who has an insecurity against a certain group and disguises those insecurities. And that's what stands out against J.K. Rowling's book. And in the book of Sons of the Lambs, they really go out their way to highlight that trans transsexual people are decent people and and they normalize it by introducing you to doctors clinics they, they normalize it by introducing you to these concepts which many people aren't aware of before and they make and they, they really realize it by highlighting the difference between uh buffalo bill the serial killer and actual transsexuals and it's given more credit to the fact that uh, levine really went out of his way as an actor to really study the character and study LGBT issues. So that's the immediate difference between uh, Silence of the Lambs and uh, her new book, uh, which I can't remember the name off the of my head just now. What was it again? It was, yeah, Troubled Blood. Okay. J.K. Rowling had no real research into trans issues whatsoever. Well, as the author of Silence of the Lamb and the actor as well behind Buffalo Bill, put an absolute ton of energy into it so maybe that might answer i don't i'm not seeing pretty little liars so i can answer that i don't know if you know enough background on the actors or actresses or or whoever they were who played the characters if they did enough research into this issues either but i suspect that the reason there's so much outrage is because with jk rowling is because there's so much evidence of her own bigotry yeah. that this is no surprise whereas yeah. for these other other uh, medias there's clearly been research done and there's clearly a narrative there which shows the difference between who a trans person is against who a serial killer is a, a why trans people are completely normal and decent people against yeah. jk rowling's trans people are dangerous because of, of their existence yeah sort of thing. so <laughs> yeah, yeah that's the major the, difference yeah yeah i think i think what really highlights uh Jackie Wong's new book is that because she has all this documented uh, bigotry against her, and 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 but but I do think that if she if she didn't have all this documented bigotry against her, and if she and she and if she just released this book, oh, this is just a story I want to tell. I think there would still be a tiny bit of outrage because that because there always will be, but I don't think it would have been as massive as it is now mm-hmm. because um because. So, 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 like, had she released this book without all this documented uh, uh, bigotry, I don't think it would have been as big of a deal as it is now. Because, 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 like, people just see this book as a way for her to basically vent out all her bigotry and and stuff like that. So, yes, so yeah, I think I think that is that is that is one of the reasons why this book has gotten so much uh, negative publicity. Um, 
publicity and, and like with your example because because the people involved in that storyline did like so much research into it i think i think i think they were they were able to um um like uh, like portray a story like that but like with like so much research into it so it's so yeah 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 we're now going to move on to the next subject and we're staying <laughs> okay. with literature we're going from jk rowling really to roll Dal. This You're is probably wondering, what? why are we jumping to Roald Dahl? What's <laughs> going on here? Well, we're not just jumping to Roald Dahl, we're jumping to one of my all-time favourite, if not, it's, it's, I think it's arguably, has to be top for me anyway, uh, top three uh, I thought you were about to go get stories. the book there. I thought you were about to go get the book. I, by the time I get the book, I'll be like 10 minutes away because I'll be going through all my bloody bookshelves. Yeah. But no, but, this but then I remembered be... that. But then I remembered that the audience won't be able to see us. So. <laughs> yeah, so you can just edit it like, whatever. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Harry Potter is one of my all time favorite, um, all time favorite books as a childhood, and uh, I, I've, I've loved it. Uh, I, I, the reason why I'm talking about it now is because we, we discussed J.K. Rowling, which is the framing of her books. We're now going to analyse, uh, you know, Charlie Chocolate Factory, reflect on how we saw it as kids, and now reflecting on it now as as uh, younger young adults. Uh, but more importantly, as well, we're going to link to how we change it. I got a bit of background to this, so my stepdad James Browning, he is doing a show on this right in the near future on Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And I was speaking to you about this last night, Kieran. Um, yeah. I, I thought it would be really good to kind of put, go a bit more in detail on this. Um, and basically, he, any changes... Now, for those who don't know, uh, there are two versions of a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory which are basically in stone, which any director who has the rights to it are allowed to do. Um, there's a kind of a UK version, which was pretty successful. Uh, and then there's a US version, which kind of flopped, basically. And I think the reason it flopped was because they, the, the children characters, they were actually played by um, adults which I can never get my head around for the US version. Um, and also as well, just kind of a few design changes there as well, which just didn't really catch on. Um, and what my my stepdad, James, is trying to do right now with this is he's trying to get subtle changes, which hopefully Warner Brothers and the Dow family can actually accept. And he's trying to do it from a class perspective. Uh, and I introduced and Kieran's gonna love this I introduced my Marxist perspective into this as well in order to try and change the story so before we take on this perspective Kieran tell me how you first viewed Charlie the Chocolate Factory when you were younger okay. what is your kind of memories of it would you say okay so basically this is this is like my whole experience with the entire um franchise because it's a whole franchise now, isn't it? Like, um, yeah, uh, it's a whole franchise. Kind of, now, it, is a franchise like just multiple film media, or is it like just a single? Well, it's a it's a yeah. big it's a big thing. It's very yeah. influential. Yeah. At least okay. kids have only probably okay. seen so, once um, at least. Okay, so uh, so I I saw the I saw the original movie uh, in the seventies. Uh, well, it was made in the seventies, but um, but so 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 I saw that movie when i was younger and 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 then i read the book uh when i was a bit older and and yeah so um so and i guess my i guess my reaction is that it is pretty it does have a small left-wing view um anyway if you if you if you if you if you like really look into the meanings of it because um because the um because the the entire story is about is about uh uh was kids who who then who basically win win golden tickets to go see his chocolate factory and the person that basically makes it the furthest in the factory is the one that was basically the least greedy that like, followed all the rules and all the other kids were kind of eliminated because like they were bad they were selfish and so so it kind of like has that has that overall message of like not don't be selfish and like and like um and like be kind to others and like don't be so greedy so so um so so 
in a way, that's a very left-wing message anyway, I would say. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's got, a, yeah, as you say, it's got a mix there. So obviously a working class kid uh, successfully kind of taking on uh, the factory at the end there, as you, the doing so deservedly. Um, but it's also got some kind of more, I don't want to say pro-capitalist, because that sounds as if it's done intentionally for a pro-capitalist narrative, but it's not. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of just a, a kind of general theme, where basically, first of all, in, in the original book, uh, for Charlie uh, to actually succeed, he has to blindingly follow Wonka, uh, in the sense that he must follow his commands, uh, he must follow this massive businessman who's got all this capital, basically, and create this sort of perfect world by using his imagination, of course, within the factory. And people kind of, like, look up to Willy Wonka because of all this capital, because it was a massive enfranchisement, and it's kind of, kind of control he has on the chalk, on the ch- basically the chocolate market, effectively. And, um, but another, so that's one element to it as well. And also as well, the children themselves, when they break rules, they are a representation of classic sin, which isn't a capitalist thing, by the way. That's just a kind of a religious element to it. Um, where basically, uh, Augustus, if you all remember, he's representative of kind of greed. Um, who is, I think, actually, they all represent basically a form of greed in, the, in themselves, and, but different, other, but also ignorance uh, and etc. I don't remember all the sins off the top of my head at this very moment, but if you watch it, you will very quickly catch on their representations of different sort of classic Christian sins. And Charlie is basically sort of like a holy embodiment of Jesus of pure innocence and all all good. So there's that element too as well, and I don't think there's much kind of uh, disagreement with any. I don't think anyone's like heavily pushing against that kind of theme. It's a very okay, acceptable theme. It's, I've had it's not more than okay. It's actually a very good theme because obviously don't do bad things, kids. Duh. Yeah. But uh, it's interesting though. And then I want to take on to the controversial one though, which people don't discuss because when people do discuss it, it kind of ruins the theme, kind of ruins the good vibes, but the Oompa Loompas. Mm. And I'm sorry to say, but... And people don't want to admit it, but they are largely based off kind of classic racist stereotypes of black people who are very much demonized for being small and being very tribalistic and very much being led by the kind of white savior uh, from kind of a British, you know, from a kind of, you know, it's inspired by this British imperialist, uh, Western expansionist sort of vibes of you know, the West shall save you. Uh, the, the industrial world is here, basically. Um, no one talks about that much. There's actually a few papers on this as well. Um, I can't remember. The, I'll, I'll actually link some papers in the description just now because I, I don't want to go into too much detail. But that's the main thing which people don't want to talk about. The Oompa Loompa is a base of racist, racist stereotypes. And they're also, in a sense, kind of weirdly slaves in Harry, Harry Potter. No, <laughs> Charlie the Chocolate Factory. Sorry, there are no Oompa Loompas in Harry Potter. Let's not, let's not, I don't, I don't even see that crossover <laughs> at all. But anyway, so these Oompa Loompas, they work constantly and they're paid in coconuts or in cocoa, basically. They're not paid in any monetary value whatsoever, and they blindly follow Wonka entirely. Uh, and even though in media they're depicted as being completely happy with this, in reality, anyone in that real situation would not be happy with that whatsoever. So that's this is the set of issues we can ha- have to be tackled with. Um, and that's where I spoke to my stepdad, and one of the first things I suggested to him was, one, the Oompa Loompas have to be free in the end. Now, Kieran, first of all, what do you think on the idea of freeing the Oompa Loompas at the end? This kind of idea that you could free the Oompa Loompas at the end of, of Charlie the Chocolate Factory. Not Harry Potter! <laughs> <laughs> How many times are you going to mention that mistake? And it's like that. But anyway, I, uh, so, um, <laughs> so, so the whole idea of, of like the Oompa Loompas basically slaving away for Willy Wonka and like Willy Wonka like gaining uh, like gaining all the profit. Basically that's what happens in the real world because obviously obviously like CEOs are like worth like millions and millions of pounds and and like the workers on the shop floor the majority of the time only only earn barely, barely enough to live on with like minimum wage. So 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 that correlation between 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 the Oompa Lumpas that actually do 
the work and they get very little reward with and and like Willy Wonka like gaining gaining all this value from like the chocolate factory which he didn't build uh so 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 yeah so so uh, so i guess you can say that's a play on on uh, on Nazi capitalism uh when it comes to the uh umpa lumpas being free that would that would set like a really good message for uh for for like the younger generation because because that could be like a, oh it's not okay to treat these people like that sort of message mm-hmm. so yeah it's, it's, it's yeah it's, yeah i would i would definitely be up for something like that yeah I think as well. I just I just know. I remember another thing as well on, on the analysis of Charlie Chocolate Factory. When it comes to the actual kids winning the tickets, at one point during the story, the characters, uh, one of the characters' fathers, I can't remember if it's uh, not. It's not Hermione. I'm still thinking of Harry Potter. Oh I can't remember her name. It's one of the kind of like ginger hair, red dress. She's kind of red coat dress as you see in the other two films. It's when her father basically. Uh, uses all the, stops all the factories to find his oh, golden um, ticket, basically, and uses workers Veruca. to do it for the, Veruca. There we go. So Veruca's father basically uses all the capital he has to halt all production and uses his workers to actually uh, to find his golden ticket. He uses he basically cheats the system and uses mass amount of capital to basically win. Whereas, of course, which shows kind of you know the representation of the idea of. People of capital will cheat their way, those without capital are, are most likely going to lose. And this is where the idea of Charlie winning fairly kind of comes in again. But that, but going back to the point you said, so Oompa is being freed. How do we write that in? I'm not really sure. But that's something that I think is really worth exploring. And I think it's worth pointing out that if the Oompa Loompas are freed, I don't think they should hate Willy Wonka. And this is kind of my thinking around this is on the idea that Willy Wonka, however he, however he worked with the Oompa Loompas, his factory is a representation of almost a perfect society, of building a world using your imagination. And obviously Wonka has this kind of research and development within the factory, which makes him miles ahead in so many technological advancements than the rest of society. But somewhere down the line, something went wrong. And he's obviously built this within this amazing world within the factory and is not expanding it further. And he's locked the Oompa Loompas in within basically within the system in which they don't own the they don't own or help or control in the system at all. They are slaves to it. Quite literally in the sense, because they're literally made of like cocoa beans, basically. Um, so that's an immediate problem. And the second suggestion I had was uh because remember, in, in the original book, Charlie largely is completely blindingly follow blindly follow Wonka. Uh, what should happen is, in this version, I'm I'm, I'm switching to my stepdad, is that Charlie should challenge Wonka and should challenge the sort of narrative that's been created here by Wonka that this perfect society should be run and kept maintained as sort of status quo. Because in the original, yeah. Wonka wants a child to have who's imaginative basically and young who can continue continue to run the factory but it's a continuation of what's already built charlie should actually challenge what's going on uh by by challenging walk of the, the vision he builds and instead of having Wonka become a villain it should Wonka should be redeemed by accepting his own wrongs and passing the factory over to charlie so going back to the original point when the Oompa Loompas are essentially freed by Wonka or charlie or both at the same time they kind of they turn to Wonka going and kind of saying, We forgive you. Thank you for everything you've done, but we we forgive you now. You you did wrong. You did right, you did wrong, but we're now free, we forgive you. Um now this is this is my favorite part that's gonna come up, and this is the thing that you are really happy about, Kieran. And it's the third point being when Charlie controls a factory, it should no longer be just he controls a factory, things go normal. The next part is that the that Charlie should open up all this mean should open up all this to the rest of the world. The technology, like the, means of production. the wonders. Yeah. Of, basically, as I was going to get there, Charlie should basically give the means of production to the workers. But I'll let yeah. you take it from. I'll let yeah. you go for it. What do you think of that? Yeah. So, uh, so basically, the whole premise of like building this building this ideal world, but only restricting it to the factory that that is a perfect representation of basically 
of basically hoarding wealth which actually happens in real life like like um yeah that is that is that is a basic representation of, of like building this ideal world but only but but like but like only the few people who are lucky to go to this factory uh, get to experience it that is a classic example of, of basically hoarding wealth and and i i i'm not sure what what road Dahl was thinking when he wrote this but probably probably not uh, as was it probably not with all these political messages in mind but but that is a perfect example and and when it comes to like charlie controlling the means of production of this factory and then like letting it loose to the world that that is the most basic principle of basic socialism where basically the means of production is controlled by workers and everyone benefits because because um because everyone controls the means of their own production so basically everyone benefits from the society and and that is basically the most basic principle of socialism isn't it so yeah yeah i think what's important is that we're not turning we're not trying to turn charlie chuckle for overtly political it's already got political <laughs> in it but we're not we're not waving a red flag in children's faces and going socialism because it's basically well, basic. well I mean, okay hold on hold on well, well I, I, don't, I, I was about okay. to say in your case we're not waving the yellow flag <laughs> oh come okay <laughs> still point point being that um i think it's i think it's the basic message though of teaching kids that when charlie wins in the end he runs the factory and things are kept the same but the poverty he lives within doesn't change out with the factory other than his family and i think what's important to the, this message here is the service say to kids if you win all this all this capital they obviously don't say capital but well what how we say to kids when you have all this these all these resources and, and all this potential around you and you can share it with others do so don't hoard it for yourself and just your family. When you can help change your community, you should. And help actually build a better world. Because this is all about imagination. And if your imagination is restricted by the boundaries of a factory, then really your imagination is limited. But if your imagination, with the wonders you have from this factory, can spread across the world, then why don't you do it? What's stopping you, kid? And that's the kind of big thing I really hope is eventually delivered through a sort of new narrative of charlie the chocolate factory yeah yeah the same same silly fun narrative it's basically like it's going through it it's basically like if you have the resources to create a better world like why wouldn't you do it so yeah it's basically yeah, that exactly exactly yeah and again the rest of the story is still the exact same charlie goes through his wacky rooms and goes on his crazy adventures and also as well you have more music to it as well because the stage show has got different uh music to it uh i had i listened to i had actually heard musical yet weirdly enough because i was only talking about this the other day and i got a as i was coming to do this podcast i got a glimpse of the kind of mike tv song which was interesting i should say but i'm not gonna after this i'll have a problem listen to it but yeah i think i wonder now that once we start approaching these these reframings of these books and TV shows and films, and we reboot them, these narratives, I really, I hope that they're slightly changed with these kind of updated frameworks. Because I mean, I don't want to reboot everything and put a red sticker on it. That's not what I want. Because that would just be kind of boring. I think there needs to be just a slight narrative change. The message is subtle enough changed, where actually there's a really good message to it. And it's all about empowering communities around you rather than just empowering yourself and leaving it there essentially but um but yeah that's 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 going to be a challenge because trying to convince warner brothers and <laughs> dal family to sign up to uh <laughs> we're having charlie's cease the production for you might gotta give me an update on this <laughs> like um like uh, like when things actually go through like when covid is over and shows can go on again like like you've got to give an update on like on 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 like i will like I their will. response uh... on like their response to this <laughs> if the dals and the warner brothers don't allow us to uh see the means of production in their book and film then we shall see the means of production from them in real life <laughs> and then we'll 
Haha. <laughs> the, the <laughs> socialism begins uh, with l- taking over literature. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway. Um, so, you know, literature is the best way. Literature is 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 it's one of the best ways to get to children because because i guess i i guess we forget that children still read even though even though we're in the age of like computers and i certainly don't read as much as i used to but 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 children still read so so there is a market uh for um for that type of um of uh, children literature that can teach children these like political messages but not going over the board and mentioning these like buzzwords like socialism capitalism because 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 like there's because like here's this, here's this little game that you can play at home right so um so get a friend who doesn't normally vote labor or that like, doesn't normally support left wing parties but like that's me oh no way i don't support left wing parties but, okay. well we can we can have a discussion about the smp being left but but like <laughs> <coughs> sorry <go on. laughs> okay but but um, but but here is a game that you can play at home. So like, basically, get a friend who doesn't normally support left wing parties, or 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 um or or who doesn't normally support um other um, basically basically left wing policies, and like basically explain to them explain to them policies, but without mentioning anything political. So 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 basically explain to them socialism but without mentioning the word socialism and explain to them political party policies without actually mentioning they are political party policies and and and, and most of the time they will respond very positively to these policies but like but uh, by the minute you mention socialism oh no 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 we can't do that so it's like so so please play this game at home with your friends mention left-wing policies without actually mentioning any of the buzzwords and just see how they respond it's actually a very interesting game that i that um that um, that, that i have played a lot with my friends i only have one right-wing friend to be fair um <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't i don't know if you know her um uh, she has a singer named can um i have a podcast <laughs> of her uh, she supports. Uh, she loves Keir Starmer, and uh, oh god, I am not like, right wing. So uh, yeah, that's what a right wing person would say, of course. <laughs> and first of all, I do. And first of all, I don't love Keir Starmer. I, <laughs> I mean, say it, say it, say it. Just say it. You like him. You fa- you, no, you like him. No, I mean, no, I, I, I mean, I mean, I support the Labour Party and I support socialism. That that doesn't mean that doesn't mean I have to like every single leader that that company goes. Like, do you think I like Tony Blair? No. Like, do you think I like Miliband? Okay, he was better, but still not getting there. So, 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 like, so, like, I support the Labour Party and I support socialism. But that doesn't mean I have to. But that, but that doesn't necessarily mean that I have to agree with every single leader that comes along. Like, you probably don't like Salmon anymore. You, you see, you see this, you see this, folks. Awfully defensive. Honestly, I, I, I have my doubts sometimes. But anyway, <laughs> anyway, I'm, 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 I'm just. I'm just teasing, obviously. Okay. Um, obviously not left wing. Okay, fine. Oh, it's left wing. Kieran is left wing. Okay, fine. Say. Okay, fine. Answer me this question: Do you still like Alex Salmon? Well, you you obviously know that I I don't like Alex see, Salmon. See, so. see, see, that's see, see. It's I was trying, you don't to, have trying to say to diplomatically like as much as possible. You don't have to like every single politician in your party. You don't have to agree with every single policy to be in a party. It's basically like stepping stones to where you want to be like 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 even like even under the current state of the labor party i'm not happy with with basically the direction Keir has taken the labor party in but i still support the labor party socialism and and i still support the left-wing vision but it's just voting labor to is it's like it's like a stepping stone. It is like a stepping stone to to socialism. I didn't see it that way under Jeremy Corbyn, because obviously Jeremy Corbyn is like a proper socialist. So, so like I didn't see I'll it let, that I'll way. Unless you're in Scotland, of course. If you vote Labour, there. Whoa! Richard Leonard is a lefty. Richard Leonard is a lefty. Uh, but okay, but does the party actually believe in like reducing the British state to a, a, a reduced number in order to shrink a capital of the UK by building a smaller state within a social independent Scotland? And then transferring that power to local communities. Oh no! Wait, that's it. 
I want to let okay, the party well, call support independent. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll, I'll let you have the last word. We need to actually end this podcast now because we're now just on to a completely different discussion. But like, here, last word on you, go. On what? On this, on just, oh, okay, fine. That was, that was your last word. We're moving on. We're not, I'm not, we're, we're not discussing Richard Leonard anymore or Labour. Sorry. Uh, okay, fine. Okay, fine. My last word on Richard Leonard and the Scottish Labour Party. See, see, you probably know that I have met Richard Leonard and, and I supported his campaign back when he was running because I, because I thought, because, because I thought he was the better choice out of him and the other guy, Samuel or something. But yeah, so, so, so yeah, so yeah, I supported his leadership campaign. I do think Richard Leonard is a lefty. The problem isn't Richard Leonard and the policy that he supports. The problem is that the, the problem with the Scottish Labour Party is that they are not accepting of constitutional changes. That's that's the problem. That's the problem. That's the problem within the Scottish Labour Party is that is that they are completely willing to ignore the entire constitutional question. Like 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 you ask Scottish Labour about the constitution, they will just say no straight out. And and but but they are seeming to forget that a lot of their supporters support independence. Like literally every Scottish friend I have in Labour supports independence. So it's like. They are completely blank on the on the constitutional question, and and we've seen and we've seen independence roll um, uh, unfortunately get more support in the polls. So it's like, Oi! <laughs> go on, go on, go on. no, no, shut so it, it, shut it. So no, it's no. like, so it's like, so it's like you can't ignore what you're seeing in the polls. Like the Labour Party tried to do that with Brexit, and and how did that work out for them? They lost bloody their entire red wall because they ignored the British people on Brexit. So, you, so, 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 like, so, so, like, take a lesson from Brexit. Do not ignore the polls, and do not ignore, basically, yeah, just don't ignore the polls and don't ignore an instruction because because Labour tried that with Brexit and it didn't work because we lost our entire red wall because of it. So, like, yeah, like. Like they should really learn lessons from Brexit. Like you can't ignore changes, and you can't ignore the int- yeah. I like Richard Leonard because he's from New York. Yeah, that's my that's my hot take. I mean, my family are from New York in large part, so yeah, no, no I like Richard Leonard because he's from New York. That's how that's my my, my one link to him. Well, I stand York. I think he's actually from Lancashire. Leonard. Uh, I think he's actually uh, from he, Lancashire. He's senator. <laughs> he is. He's Yorkshire. <laughs> That's his words. Oh, I'll have it any other way. Also, oh, you went to Stirling University as well, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe I should yeah. get a coffee with him and just sit down. Like, yo, let's uh, yeah. let's catch up. Let's. Uh, he probably he never will. But you know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> thank you for listening to the North South Divide podcast. We had a bit of a tangent there. Forgive us. That is just what we do. That's the whole point us. of having. Forgive, 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 Kieran. I try to keep her straight on the topic, but she just has to go on about something else. Honestly, can't control her mental. But anyway. Uh, we've discussed J.K. Rowling and her... She, she is going to kill me one day. We've discussed J.K. <laughs> Rowling and her subtle and subtle bigotry within her writing. We've discussed how it compares to other literature when it comes to the issues of uh, other themes such as transgender people or any other people of any sort. And then, of course, we tied it to Charlie Chocolate Factory and Charlie seizing the means of production and freeing the workers as well and the Oompa Loompas from their racist stereotypes. Anyway, I am Karen Archibald. I'm Kieran Khan. And you've been watching the Podcast. Thank you. Thank you very much. Goodbye.